Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Social Housing of Laboratory Rabbits, and presented by Sarah Thurston, a Social Housing Coordinator at University of Michigan. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen, type the questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, please click on the Help Desk located on the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen, or use that ask a question box and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the accreditation button located on the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen. Please join me now in welcoming our presenter, Sarah Thurston, and we'll now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Thurston, and like Susie said, I'm the Social Housing Coordinator at the University of Michigan. Um, today, I'm going to be discussing our extensive social housing program with laboratory rabbits. We have an average yearly census of around 400 rabbits um, at a time, and because of this, we have faced and troubleshot many challenges with the social housing of such a large uh, population of animals. So for today's presentation, I'm going to focus on answering some of the most common questions that arise regarding the social housing of rabbits. So these include, how do their wild counterparts live? So for this, we're gonna look into the natural history of our New Zealand white rabbits. Why are we socially housing rabbits? For this, we're gonna look at the regulations as well as the rabbit preferences. Is social housing actually good for the rabbits? For this, we're gonna look at the benefits of social housing as well as the detriments of social isolation. And then how do we create new pairs? For this, we'll go through our methods of pair creation. As a part of that, what behavior should I monitor for? So we're gonna go through our ethogram that we've developed and the behaviors that you're gonna to wanna to look through as a part of that. And then how do I maintain these rabbit pairs once I've created them? So for this, we'll go through some methods for pair maintenance. And then lastly, what do I do if I can't socially house my rabbits? So for this, we're gonna go through some alternative methods to social housing. So before we begin, I would like to offer the disclaimer that I will only be discussing New Zealand white rabbits today um, because that is what the majority of our very large colony consists of. Uh, we do also, also pair house Dutch belted rabbits here um, and we pair and maintain them utilizing the same methods that I will be presenting here today. Um, however, we just don't have high enough numbers that we can really confidently recommend um, the methods in regards to those, but we have had good success with it so far. Um, but today when I say rabbit, I'm going to be um, describing New Zealand white rabbits exclusively. Okay, so to answer the first question of how do their wild counterparts live, we're gonna look at the natural history of the New Zealand white rabbit. So the rabbits that are most abundant in North America are gonna be cottontails. And around us here in Michigan, we mostly only see the Eastern cottontail, the Silvilagus floridanus. Um, this causes a lot of confusion for people because they will sometimes ask, why are we trying to socially house our laboratory rabbits when the rabbits that live in my backyard are solitary, I never see them with other rabbits? Um, so the main answer to this question is that they are not the same rabbit. Um, the eastern cottontail is what we are going to see in our backyards. However, the European rabbits, which are the ancestors of our New Zealand whites, are a social species. So to look at the natural history of kind of comparing these two, the Silvilagus are the ones that we're gonna see in our backyards. These are a solitary rabbit. They're territorial and they're not gonna burrow. However, the Erectolagus, which are the um, European rabbits and the ancestors of our New Zealand whites, these are a social species. They live in warrens of about six to 12 adults and they do burrow. They create these very uh, complex underground burrows with lots of entrances and exits. Um, 
And European rabbits can live in distinct social groups of up to four males and up to six females. Um, so this shows that the natural history of the New Zealand white is as a social species. So here's a picture of a European rabbit warren in England, um, in which you can see multiple rabbits living within a social group. You can see um, an entrance to that underground burrow that they've dug. Um, this is not what you're gonna see in your backyard with the Eastern cottontails that we're accustomed to seeing. So you can see where some of the confusion comes in sometimes with people. And then while it's important to know how our laboratory rabbits wild counterparts live, it's also really valuable to know whether these behaviors have been conserved when we brought them into a laboratory setting. Um, so there's been some great research to show that domesticated rabbits do re retain their social behavior, behavioral repertoire of their wild ancestors. Um, this is shown by the amount of time that the rabbits choose to spend in body contact with another rabbit um, between uh, 65% and 80% of the time they chose to be in body contact and that's the same for or that's between domestic and wild rabbits. So this shows that that social behavior that they exhibit in the wild is conserved when we bring them into a laboratory setting as well. So the next question that we're going to try to answer is why are we socially housing rabbits? Um, and this answer has a twofold answer or this question has a twofold answer. Um, we're gonna be looking at the regulations as well as the rabbit preferences. So there's three main regulatory guidelines that provide oversight to rabbit social housing. So these are gonna be the 2011 Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals, ALAC International, and the Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare, or OLA. So the 2011 guide states that single housing of a social species should be the exception. It also goes on to say that single housing should be justified based on experimental requirements or veterinary related concerns. And single housing should be reviewed on a regular basis by the IACUC and the veterinarian. ALAC also has a position statement on social housing in which they state that social housing will be considered the default method of housing for a social species. If they're not socially housed, it must be justified based on one of the following criteria, either social incompatibility, veterinary concerns, or a scientific necessity. And social housing policies and single housing exceptions should be reviewed regularly by the IACUC and the veterinarians, which goes along with um, exactly what the guide states as well. And then going along with this, OLA um, has you know, very similar regulations, and they also describe a little more about the justifications that allow for singly housing. Um, so there's three main justifications that a situation can fall into to allow a socially housed species to be singly housed. Um, you can provide scientific justification. Um, so this would be a situation where uh, for example, you need to measure water consumption in individual animals, and social housing would be incompatible with that research study. So this is anything that could affect the research that's being done by social housing. Uh, veterinary concerns for animal welfare um, is also justified. This could be a situation where you maybe have an older dog with arthritis or who needs some special medicine or treatments, and having him full-time socially housed with other kind of specific dogs um, might lead to injury or something along those lines. So veterinary concern is also justifiable. And then the last um, justification is social incompatibility. And so this could be a situation such as uh, you have a colony of sexually mature male rabbits, so they are not socially compatible to be housed together. This would be justified according to OLA. And then in addition to the regulatory guidelines regarding social housing, we also socially house based on the rabbit's preference. Um, so there's this really great study done um, that provided preference testing to female New Zealand white rabbits, and they showed that they worked almost as hard for social contact as they did for food. Um, so as you can see in the diagram, they placed the rabbit in the home cage, and there were doors that they had to push through to get to either a cage with food, an empty cage, a platform cage that had a little bit of more of a um, enriched um, cage set up um, or a social cage that provided them a small mesh panel in which they could have limited interaction with an unfamiliar rabbit. And they found that she would work almost equally as hard to have that social access as she would to get to food. Um, so this shows the incredibly high value that rabbits themselves place on social interaction with conspecifics. 
So other studies done have kind of shown similar results, finding that when given the choice, New Zealand white females would form small social groups, ranging from one to three conspecifics with house rabbits, spending about 88% of their time in close proximity. Um, so this is a really high percentage, again, showing that they really value the social contact. So the next question that we're going to answer is whether social housing is actually good for rabbits. So to answer this, we're gonna look at some of the benefits of social housing, and then we're also gonna look at the flip side of this to look at some of the detriments of social isolation. So there are lots and lots of documented uh, benefits of social housing for a social species. Um, just, I've listed just a few here. Um, social housing provides buffering from stress. Social isolation of rodents has resulted in increased aggression and hyper-responsiveness to stressors. Social housing is the ideal enrichment. It's an ever-changing interactive stimuli um, that they can constantly find enriching in new and novel ways. Group housing can reduce anxiety, boredom, and frustration, which is obviously something that we uh, don't want to see in any of our laboratory species, um, but especially when they're in like a smaller cage setting, these things can be really problematic. So group housing is a way to reduce these behaviors. And social housing also encourages active behavior. So it increases physical fitness, so there's less risk of self-injury to the back and legs, and it can also reduce gastric stasis. And then social housing also normalizes physiological values such as circadian rhythms, which can be extremely valuable to investigators when they have their entire colony um, on kind of the same cycle. So just as the benefits of social housing are well documented, so are the detriments of social isolation. Um, once again, these are just a few examples of some of the detriments of social isolation, but they can be very severe. Um, social isolation, blah, Social isolation can interfere with brain and behavioral development. It can increase oxidative stress. It can increase heart rates, cause higher white blood cell counts and a higher chance of disease progression. It can increase time spent in abnormal behaviors and it increases the time that they spend inactive. So these are all things that we really don't wanna see in our lab species um, for their overall welfare. So social isolation is most, most easily observed in the development of these chronic stress behaviors or stereotypes. Um, the ways that these tend to manifest in our rabbits are improper grooming. So we'll see urine spraying on themselves, urine staining. Um, they can not groom sometimes. They'll just get real like matted and you know, icky. They're not taking care of themselves. Or they can do the opposite and excessively groom um, to the point where they have fur plucking or over barbering, which can lead to lesions. We'll see them sometimes pacing or circling um, as a result of these. Um, sometimes we'll see metal chewing. So they'll chew on the bars or you can see them licking or chewing on the lickset or feeder, so different metal parts of their cage. Um, sometimes we'll see excessive scratching or digging at the cage floor. And we also notice sometimes odd interactions with humans. So these are gonna be behaviors that are not typical rabbit behaviors that are seen when they normally interact with their caretakers. So things like lunging and growling at their caretakers or excessively stomping when they come in the room. Um, so we treat all of these things as symptoms of chronic stress. So to really understand if social housing is good for rabbits, we first really need to understand rabbits themselves. Um, much research has been done in the past few years to understand the very complex um, nature of rabbit social behavior. For most of their time as a laboratory species, rabbits were treated and housed basically as large mice. Um, it hasn't been until the past few years when we finally started to get a more complete understanding of their social complexities that we realized that they're actually much more similar to small primates in terms of behavior. Um, they have incredibly complex social hierarchies which are similar to primates and they should be provided with the same behavioral monitoring as primate colonies are provided with. So in order to understand these complex behavioral relationships, we needed to create a behavioral ethogram. And since rabbits are a prey species, they often behave differently when there's a human observer in the room. So to circumvent this, we set up high definition cameras um, to record several hours of normal pair interactions when no humans were in the room. Um, this allowed the rabbits to express their uninterrupted species typical behaviors. 
So we then watched all these videos and scored all these videos, um, and we'll go through the ethogram later in the presentation to go through what we found and kind of what each of those individual behaviors mean. Okay, so now that we understand that rabbits are a social species who should be housed accordingly, uh, we need to determine how to actually create new pairs. So to do this, I'll go through our methods of pair creation. Before we get started, however, I do have a few overall disclaimers. Um, firstly, do not attempt to start pairing rabbits without the proper approval from the principal investigator as well as the veterinary staff at your institution. Proper training on species typical behavior is crucial to the success of this program. So make sure to do your research and get all the necessary approvals prior to starting a pairing program. Trained staff is essential to this process. Rabbits creating and maintaining their dominance hierarchies can look extremely volatile, and it is vital that the people in charge of these pairings are aware of the differences between normal behaviors and abnormal behaviors. Next, all of our rabbits are closely monitored at every stage of the pairing process by trained husbandry and veterinary staff. In pair, or later we'll talk about minor wounding that does not result in pair separation, but we just want to make it clear that even though the wounds are categorized as minor and we don't separate for them, they are still under full veterinary supervision at all times. And then the next disclaimer is that for the next little while, I'm going to be talking about methods to create new unrelated pairs. These newly created pairs are all females. We do have a very large pair housed male colony, um, but they are all sibling males. So our methods of maintenance are the same for the males. However, our methods of creation that I'll be talking about today apply just to females. We don't pair any unrelated male rabbits. Okay, and then just one final disclaimer. At the University of Michigan, all of our pair house rabbits are housed in caging. So they're housed in a double wide cage with the divider removed. Um, so today when I'm going to be describing our pairing process and our maintenance and our whole system, this is going to apply to rabbits that are paired in cages and not group house rabbits that are in a pen setting or a floor setting. Okay. So to actually start creating your pairs, there are several things you need to do prior to pairing. First, you want to get your cage set up. Um, so you're going to have a clean, neutral, double wide cage with the divider removed and you want it to contain at least two of everything. Um, anytime we're doing pairing, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to decrease any resource competition or resource guarding. So we make sure and give them at least two of everything. So they can share if they want, but they don't have to if they don't want to. Um, so make sure that you're providing a minimum of two hiding or escape opportunities. Uh, this can be a hut, a shelf, a box, or something they can hide in. You want to provide a minimum of one enrichment item per rabbit and one destructible item per rabbit. Uh, you're going to provide them with two separate piles of hay and two separate feeders and access points for water. Um, so as you go through the pairing and pair monitoring process, it's good to keep in mind that pairs should always have two of everything, just to make sure that we're not encouraging any sort of resource competition. Okay, so the day before you're going to start pairing, you're going to want to collect urine from a male rabbit within the colony. If possible, you want to use a male from the same room that the females are going to be housed in, and you want to make sure that you mark the females with urine from the same male. Um, in wild colonies, the dominant bulk will urinate on the rabbits of his breeding group to scent mark them to, um, the, he's going to scent mark the rabbits in his social group, which indicates to them that they don't need to compete aggressively. So to try to translate this into a lab setting, um, we collect urine from a male rabbit. To do this, we overturn the liner underneath the cage so that the plastic side is facing up and the urine will collect on top of the liner. So you can see there the urine collecting on top of the liner, plastic side facing up. And then you're just going to syringe off the urine. Um, Oh, sorry, my pictures didn't come up there. Anyway, you're just going to syringe off the urine from the top of the liner there and store it in a sterile conical tube. Okay, so also prior to pairing, you're going to ensure that the rabbits can be individually identified. 
I do have one final disclaimer. Um, we are having some technical problems. So there was intended to be quite a few videos in my presentation that will unfortunately not be able to be shown today. Um, so anytime you see a big blank spot on my screen, I didn't just forget to fill it in. I, there was a video there that's not going to be able to be shown, unfortunately. Um, at the end, I will give you information on where you can find those videos if you want to see them in other places. Um, and I will try to describe them as best as I can. Um, but I do apologize that when you see these gaps, it's where a video would have been. Um, but that's OK. So just know that I didn't forget to put things in my presentation. OK, so um, prior to pairing, make sure that you can ensure that rabbits can be individually identified. Um, this is going to allow you to accurately track the behaviors that are displayed by each rabbit to get an understanding of their dominance hierarchy. So you're going to want to use a blue or a purple non-toxic marker um, that's animal safe to mark the tips of their ears. Um, we've Make sure you use blue or purple because we've tried red and orange and obviously they can be confused for bodily fluids and that can cause all kinds of problems. Um, so we found blue to be the best and also if you mark the tips of the ears, this seems to be the best spot because um, you can see it really clearly from anywhere across the room and also it's harder for them to groom it off so it tends to stay on longer. Okay, so the last step before placing the females together is to mark each female with that pre-collected urine. Um, so you're going to want to add a generous amount of urine to a cotton ball or a gauze pad and place it on the rabbit's forehead and in between her ears. Um, after marking each with urine, add the animals to the neutral cage together. Make sure you add them um, pretty closely together, no more than a couple minutes in between each to prevent any one animal establishing the cage as its territory. There's just a nice video here of wiping urine onto a rabbit's forehead, which is exactly how it sounds. Um, so once you put them together, then you're going to start your monitoring process. You want to monitor them continuously for at least 60 minutes. So if you see continuous chasing by both rabbits, so we're going to call this circling, if you see any biting or clear fighting behaviors, which will be jousting or lunging, um, if you see any of those, you're going to intervene with a spray of water from a water bottle and then mark additional locations such as their back, face, or rear with urine. The water should never be used as a punishment tool. We use it merely as a distraction. Um, they usually just take like one squirt and they're going to stop what they're doing and move to their opposite sides. They don't like to be wet. So typically, if you just give them that little squirt in the back, they'll go to their opposite side and groom the water off of themselves. And it's usually enough to distract them from the aggressive behavior. So during this initial pairing process, you're going to document every behavior that you see on the ethogram. So this includes signs of aggression, submission, dominance, stressed behaviors, normal behaviors, Anything that you see is going to be put onto this ethogram um, with the corresponding time that you saw it. Um, we do this for a minimum the first hour. And the reason for that is because the majority of the aggressive interactions are seen during that first hour. Um, however, if after that first hour you feel uncomfortable leaving them, you can increase the monitoring time at your own discretion. Every pair is a little bit different, so you really want to you know, use your own discretion with this. So during that first hour, you're typically going to see a wide range of behaviors. Um, some of the most commonly seen behaviors in that first hour, other than your normal rabbit behaviors like eating, drinking, laying down, um, are going to be mounting, chasing, nipping, and fur plucks. You'll probably see quite a bit of little fur balls fly as they're you know, figuring out this first initial process, and that's normal. Um, if clear fighting behavior does develop, this is when you're going to interrupt with a spray from the water bottle. Or if that doesn't work, you're going to manually uh, separate them. Make sure you put on thick gloves because their nails are very sharp and you will get injured. Um, it is really important in this initial stage to not intervene too quickly. Um, it's very hard for us to overcome that sensation because when we see them doing this behavior, 
we initially want to separate them. We don't want them to get injured. However, this is how they work out their dominance hierarchy. This is a very normal thing for them. Um, and when we intervene too quickly, we can disrupt that hierarchy establishment process and they can be unable to determine it if we just keep intervening. So we don't want to intervene too quickly. It's really important and it's really hard to train ourselves in that because um, that's instinctually we want to jump in. Um, but it's very important to not intervene right away. So there are many signs that a pair is establishing a successful versus an unsuccessful social introduction. Um, some successful indicators are clear dominance and submissive behaviors, um, affiliative behaviors such as grooming, eating or drinking, resting side by side. These are obviously very positive things. Um, there are also some signs that you are having an unsuccessful introduction. This can be both rabbits engaging in dominance behaviors. This would indicate that you have two dominant rabbits which is obviously not going to be a successful pair. Um, if you see any resource guarding, it's not a great sign. Um, and then, of course, if you see any wounding, this is you know, a real indicator of an unsuccessful introduction. Um, if wounding is observed at any time, contact the veterinary staff right away. Um, but we don't separate the pair unless the wounds are to the genitals or the eyes or there's active bleeding um, or like a deep lesion that you think might need a suture. Those are the only reasons that you're going to separate. If you just see a small lesion, we're going to leave this pair together and work through it. But you're still always going to report it to the veterinary staff, any wounding. So if after that first hour they're resting and eating peacefully, they've discontinued um, any chasing, and they're showing successful indicators of pairing, you can go ahead and leave the room. You're going to conduct two additional 10-minute checks throughout the rest of the day. And if that pair continues to be stable after both of your additional checks, you can leave them together overnight. So that first morning after co-housing, um, it's also a little nerve wracking or, you know, that first morning you're always very nervous, especially when you begin. Um, but just in our experience, we've done this quite a bit. We very, very, very rarely find wounding that next morning. So um, you're going to be nervous, but it will be okay. Um, that next morning, though, you want to make sure and examine animals for wounds. So that you want to physically touch them to make sure you're feeling under the fur for any scabs you might have missed. Make sure you check the genitals. Um, once again, separate if you find any wounding to the genitals or eyes, uh, any deep or actively lesions, absolutely you're going to separate right away. Any lesions at all or any wounding, you're going to contact the veterinary staff. I'm going to say that a lot to make sure that it's very reiterated. Um, when we separate, what types of wounding, but make sure that for any wounding, you contact your veterinary staff. So once a pair has successfully completed overnight co-housing without any evidence of serious wounding, and the pair is demonstrating compatible behaviors, they are considered a stable pair. You're gonna document this on that rabbit social introduction log, and you're gonna generate an interaction and enrichment log. Stable pairs should be monitored at least once daily for 10 minutes for the next week, um, and additional enrichment can be placed if you feel it's necessary. Okay, so now we'll go through the behaviors that we use to create our ethogram. So you're going to monitor for these behaviors during pairing and all throughout the life of the pair. These are positive, neutral, negative, and communication interactions. And we're going to go through each behavior individually. Um, and this, I apologize again, um, this is where we have videos showing all of these behaviors we will not be able to show those today. So I will try and explain it as best as I can, but I, I'm not a rabbit, so it's gonna be a little hard to understand some of these. I will show you, or tell you at the end where you can view these videos. Okay, so first up, we're gonna go through the positive behaviors. Um, since rabbits have such a structured dominance hierarchy, there always needs to be a clear dominant and a clear submissive rabbit. Um, so you really wanna see signs indicating that you have a dominant and a submissive. Um, so in this particular video, what we saw was there was a submissive eating at the feeder and the dominant came over and he wasn't um, aggressive or forceful. He just kind of made his presence known and the submissive moved away so that the dominant could eat from that feeder. In that relationship, you can clearly see who's dominant and who's submissive. There's no fighting, there's no aggression. It's just a clear um, hierarchy relationship. So this is what we want to see. 
if you see them sharing resources, this is a great sign. Um, usually what we see in our rabbits is they tend to eat all their food together out of one feeder, and then they'll go to the other side and eat all the food together out of the other feeder. Um, so this is a really positive sign. They're choosing to share their resources, even though, remember, they have two of everything. So they don't have to share if they don't want to. They're choosing to share. So this is a really positive thing. Anytime we see aloe grooming, this is very positive. So this is going to be when one rabbit is grooming the other rabbit. Um, we typically see the dominant grooming the submissive, but not always. Sometimes it does go the other way, um, and that does not seem to indicate any sort of pair breakdown. Um, it's just each pair seems to be a little bit different. Um, but when we see this, this is a very positive sign. And then we also consider self-grooming to be a very positive sign um, because then when they're in that space together, if a rabbit felt really threatened by her partner, she's not going to take the time to groom herself and put herself in a vulnerable position, especially when they, you'll see them groom and they kind of go up on their back legs and they expose their bellies. Um, they're putting themselves in a very vulnerable position. And if she felt threatened by her partner, she wouldn't do that. So if you see them self-grooming near each other, this is a really positive sign that they feel safe and secure within that relationship with their partner. If you see them sharing space, this is obviously a great sign. Um, they have two full-size cages. So if they don't want to, they don't have to be anywhere near each other. So when they choose to be together and choose to share space, this is a really good sign. Um, and I'm really bummed about this video because this video happened to show two adult males that were almost two years old and they're huge and they both choose to snuggle up together on this one perch. Even though they have the whole two cages, they want to snuggle together on this one perch and they lay like that all the time. Um, so I always like to show that video when people say that you can't pair house adult males because we have lots of examples to prove otherwise. Um, and those two old males are a really good example of that. Um, so when you see them sharing space, this is a good thing. Any interaction with the enrichment is great. If you see them interacting with it solo, um, this is positive. They're having fun. They're utilizing their enrichment. They're using the enrichment for whatever they're supposed to be doing to be expressing you know, natural behaviors. This is great. Even better is when you see them interacting with the enrichment together. Um, this particular video showed, <coughs> excuse me, showed two rabbits that were interacting with an enrichment device together, and they're not fighting over it. They weren't, you know, trying to take it from each other. There was no aggression. They were just choosing to play with it together, even though they have two. They don't have to share. They were doing it together. They were tearing apart a, I think it was a tube that was stuffed with hay and toys and things. So they're choosing to interact together with the enrichment. So this is a really great sign. So the next category of behaviors are neutral behaviors. And these are exactly what they sound like um, when your rabbits are not interacting at all. So you can see in this cage, they are as far apart as they possibly can be. One sleeping on one perch, one sleeping on the other perch. Um, they are not interacting in any way. This can be totally fine and it can be just a normal behavior. However, if you are monitoring a pair and every single day they are consistently neutral, all you ever see are neutral behaviors, you wanna keep a really, really close eye on this pair. Um, what this tends to indicate is that they have not established their dominant hierarchy, and these are the pairs that tend to lead to wounding. Um, so once again, I don't wanna scare anybody. It can just be a pair that you don't see interact and that's fine. But if you consistently only see neutral behaviors and you never see any positive or negative behaviors, it's only neutral, just keep an extra close eye on this pair. And then next up, we'll go through the negative behaviors. Um, so for the aggressive behaviors, these are going to be things like circling, biting, you know, obvious aggressive interactions. Um, for the circling, it's really important to know what circling is and what circling is not. So circling is when both rabbits are chasing each other in a circle, um, like a little you know, tornado, like they're both going around each other in a circle. Um, it is not one rabbit chasing and the other rabbit fleeing away. That's a totally different behavior that we'll talk about later. Um, this is both rabbits continuously circling each other, trying to get at each other. This is aggressive. This is something that you want to intervene in with that spray of water. Um, another behavior that's a little bit more subtle, but it's really, really important that your technicians are trained to recognize 
a difficulty establishing dominance. Um, so in this particular video, it looks like you have a totally normal pair. Um, so you have a dominant on top and, a, and she's mounting the submissive on the bottom and she's doing some aloe grooming. It looks totally normal. It looks like you've got a fine pair. However, as the video goes on, you'll start to see the submissive turn around and start to nip at the dominant. She starts to kind of nip at her face a little bit, like she's, and she looks like she's starting to get kind of annoyed. She starts to kind of try and shake her off a little bit. Eventually, she turns around and chases the dominant away. This shows that that submissive rabbit is not submissive. She does not want to be submissive, and this pair has not worked out their dominant hierarchy. They don't know who's dominant. They both clearly want to be dominant. Um, typically, these pairs do not succeed. Um, so you want to be really watchful for these kinds of behaviors. If you have two dominants in a pair, they're obviously not going to be successful. Um, this was another video that showed a similar situation um, where at first it seemed like they were a successful pair um, and then that kind of broke down. Um, what was interesting about this video though is the submissive rabbit that was on the bottom, she was being mounted by the dominant. She struggles to get away. When she runs away, she doesn't run to the other side of the cave. She's not afraid, she's not hurt, she's not injured. She turns around and comes and gets back on top of the dominant. So the one that was submissive, she wants to be dominant. So this again is a clear sign that this is a pair that has not established their dominant hierarchy. They don't know who's in charge. Um, in this particular pair, we did have to separate them because they couldn't figure it out. Um, so make sure that people are trained in knowing what those behaviors look like. Okay, so these next ones are kind of a gray area. Um, they're communication interactions. So they're all really normal, natural behaviors that rabbits use to communicate with each other. Um, so that makes it kind of confusing because they're normal behaviors for a rabbit. However, when you put these pairs in a lab setting where they have limited space to flee away from each other, these communication behaviors can sometimes turn into aggression if they're not checked. Um, so because of that, we do make sure and intervene in these behaviors, even though they're not necessarily negative behaviors. So it's, it's kind of confusing. Um, we were finding that these are the behaviors that people were separating for the most. So we want to make it clear that we do not need to separate for these behaviors. These are normal ways that rabbits communicate their dominance hierarchy, and they do not need to be separated for these. So the first is a chase flea behavior. Um, I wish I could show you the video because it makes it a lot more clear the difference between circling and a chase flea, but you can visualize it. Um, so the circling is where they're gonna be going at each other, both of them around in a circle. That's a negative behavior. A chase flea is where you're gonna have one chase and one flea. This is okay. Um, you can clearly see when you watch that behavior who's the dominant rabbit and who's the submissive rabbit. As long as one is fleeing while one is chasing, that's okay. Um, in the wild, some dominant rabbits require an act of submission from all their submissives as often as every single day. So you might see this behavior every day, and this is just the dominant reinforcing that he or she is dominant and the submissive reinforcing that he or she is submissive. And so this is okay. We don't want to separate for this behavior. Same with mounting, like we see in a lot of our other species, it's a very normal dominance behavior. We do not want to separate when we see this. We see a lot of urine marking um, in our male rabbits, but we also see it quite a bit in our female rabbits. Um, so you can see in the picture, there's urine staining on the shelf and on the cage, and then also on the rabbit itself, on his nose and on his face. Um, this is pretty common. It's just a way that they're using to kind of mark who's dominant and who's submissive. Um, I think it's more frustrating for the technicians because as soon as they change the cage, the rabbit's going to mark all over it again to make sure that you know their territory is known. So they always get kind of frustrated when they choose to express themselves in this way. Um, but this is a normal behavior. We do not want to separate for this. And same with barbering. We don't separate other species for barbering. We don't want to do it for rabbits. Um, you're typically going to see barbering start on the nose, in between the ears, and on the back of the neck. Um, you just want to keep an eye on it to make sure it doesn't progress to where it might be a lesion or something like that. 
Um, and then excessive thumping, this is kind of a hard one to explain. This is not when you go in a room and one rabbit thumps and then they all thump and they get excited. This is not that. Um, or when you pull out the food bin and they all start thumping. This is not that. This is totally different. This is a behavior, a communication behavior between the dominant and the subordinate rabbit. Um, in this particular video, the dominant rabbit was staring at the submissive rabbit. The dominant rabbit was standing up tall. The submissive rabbit was laying down low with her chin down. Um, and the dominant rabbit was never breaking eye contact with the submissive and was just repeatedly excessively thumping. This is a very clear, intimidating dominance behavior. Um, but this, once again, is a normal communication behavior that we do not want to separate for. Okay. So now that we've established how to create a pair and what behaviors we need to be looking for, we're going to cover how to maintain that pair. So we do this by a three-step approach, enrichment intervention, and documentation and monitoring. So the first step is when any of those negative behaviors or any of those blue communication behaviors, whenever we see those, we increase their enrichment to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then we're going to document their observation Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, so when I say increase the enrichment to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that means Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they're getting a new enrichment item each of those days. And then if it progresses to the second step, this is if those aforementioned behaviors get worse or if you know any new behaviors, you're going to increase that enrichment to daily and document observation of that pair daily. And daily means weekends, holidays, every single day of the year, this pair is going to get a new enrichment, two new enrichment items and documented observation. Hopefully those first two steps work and you don't ever progress to step three. However, if you do, um, this would be when the previous enrichment intervention did not fully succeed and some aggression does occur. This is where you're going to spray with water to distract, monitor closely for five to ten minutes, and at this point you need to put them on enrichment and documented observation daily. Just to reiterate this again, if any wounding occurs, you need to notify the veterinary staff immediately. But do not separate the pair. We do not separate the pair unless the wounding is on the genitals, the eyes, there's a deep puncture or an actively bleeding lesion. Just to reiterate that one last time, these are the only reasons that we immediately separate a pair. Any genital wounding, eye wounding, an actively bleeding lesion, or a deep puncture, something that you think might need a suture or something. If we see a small scratch or a scrape or, you know, a little hair pull or, you know, scratch on the ear, these are typical things that we see a lot with rabbit pairing. We do not separate for this. These are the only reasons that we immediately separate. However, we of course do report them to the veterinary staff and they are under monitoring. So the second part of our maintenance plan is enrichment intervention. It is important to know that you must get approval from your enrichment committee, your veterinary staff, and your PI before you get any new enrichment items. Uh, our kind of just standard baseline hay, all rabbits receive hay every single day, no matter what their social housing status is. So if they are um, singly housed, pair housed, pregnant, lactating, weanling, anything, no matter what, you get hay every single day. Um, we do this because studies have shown that hay is effective in reducing abnormal behaviors and it should be provided daily, so we do. Um, for our enrichment, we found that rabbits get bored extremely easily um, and so it's really vital to rotate um, between different groups to maintain novelty of enrichment items, otherwise it completely loses its value for the rabbits. Um, so we have a few different enrichment groups that we rotate between. We have low value, high value, and supplemental enrichment, and we'll go through those. Um, and then just as a side note too, we autoclave all of our cardboard items prior to providing them to the rabbits, just to make sure that we prevent the, prevent the spread of any pathogens. So our low value enrichment are going to be things that they can easily manipulate around the cage. Uh, things like toys, cardboard, wood blocks, wood shoe sticks. Um, things that provide them value and that they enjoy, but it's not going to provide long term value. You know, they're going to get bored with it fairly quickly. Um, so here I just had a couple videos that showed the value of cardboard. It's one of our favorite enrichments because it's free, it's easily sanitizable, and it's quick for the technician, and the rabbits actually love it. Um, so we just take the liner boxes that the rabbit liners come in, 
we cut them into strips, we autoclave them, roll it up, and you can stick it right in the cage doors. And the rabbits will take a while like trying to get it into the cage, and then once they get it in there, they'll scratch it and dig it up and um, make a big mess with it and just have a great time. Um, so it's really quick for the techs, and it takes the rabbits a while, and it costs nothing. So perfect enrichment item. So our high value, high value enrichment items are gonna be destructibles. Um, any of you who have spent time with rabbits know that they love to destroy things. So these are gonna be things like tubes stuffed with hay or shredded paper, boxes, bags, uh, balls stuffed with things. We stuff them with treats, toys, all kinds of things. If you have rabbits that are you know, kind of figured it out a little too much, you can compound this. You can stuff a tube inside of a box, stuff that, stuff it inside a bag, you know, get really creative with it. Um, but they absolutely love these destructibles. Um, yeah, this was a really cute video of some rabbits just destroying some stuffed bags. It's uh, definitely a favorite with the technicians as well because it's something that you can, you can create for them, you can give it to them, and you can immediately see them enjoying it and having fun with it. Um, so it's really positive for the staff and the rabbits. So our next high value enrichment item is food treats, which is obviously high value with pretty much any animal and humans. Um, we just want to make sure, similar to primates, that we provide it in a way that encourages uh, them to have to engage to get the treat. So um, we try and provide it either fresh, frozen, dried. We try and stimulate different senses. Sometimes we'll, you know, freeze things and mash in fresh fruit and then sprinkle like dried parsley on top or something. Just ways that they can have to kind of work for it or forage for something. Um, if you just hand them a carrot, they're gonna like it, but the value is gonna be a little lower than if they have to work for something. And then our last group of enrichment is supplemental enrichment. So these are things that are never provided as the sole enrichment item, um, but are provided in addition to the other enrichment items. So these are gonna be things like um, instrumental music, a white noise machine. Um, with both of these things, we make sure that we put them on timers so they're never on more than eight hours a day at the absolute maximum. Um, and we use grooming brushes too when we have rabbits that are uh, friendlier or tend to enjoy it or when they're out for a nail trim, we'll kind of give them a brush with the grooming brush to see how they like it. Make sure you don't ever do this if the rabbit appears stressed by it, obviously. And then just to really quickly show how impactful this enrichment can be, this was a paired female who had gotten in a fight with her sister. And you can see she's got lesions on her ears. She's got some lesions and hair loss on her nose as well. So we put them under monitoring. And the only thing that we changed is we increased their enrichment to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That was the only treatment. By day 11, you can see both of the lesions on her ears have healed and the lesion on her nose is much smaller and there's some hair growing back in. And then by day 14, sorry, it was a video again, so it doesn't show up, but I promise it was completely healed. Uh, her ears were totally healed, her nose was totally healed, and most of the hair had actually started to grow back in. And the only thing we did was increase our enrichment. Um, so it really, really does make a difference in these guys' lives, it's very valuable. Okay, so the last part of our pair maintenance plan is increased documentation and monitoring of pairs. For each pair, we monitor their age in weeks using a vertical flag behind their cage card. Um, this allows the room technician to quickly be able to scan a room and know which pairs are kind of in that danger zone. Um, since sexual maturity between, begins between weeks 12 to 17, um, we did an, an internal study here and found that around half of the negative interactions begin between weeks 10 to 20. So we want to be able to quickly visualize who is in that 10 to 20 week zone so that we can kind of provide a little extra monitoring and care for that pair. So every single pair has their own social housed interaction and enrichment log. This log is used to detail the pair's history as well as what enrichment is provided to the pair and how they interact with that enrichment. Each pair must be monitored and documented for a minimum of one day per week for five to 10 minutes. And this is on top of the daily observations that the um, husbandry technician is already doing of that pair. Um, this log is extremely valuable for tracking the ebb and flow of a pair's relationship. When problems start to arise, we can go back and kind of track their behavior. So it's really valuable to have. 
So utilizing the described methods over a 12 month period, we've maintained 172 rabbit pairs. 62% uh, of those were female, but 38% were males. Um, out of that, only 8% of total pairs had to be separated for fighting. Um, and the, those were separated at an average of 18 and a half weeks old. So they were right in that danger zone of the 10 to 20 weeks. Our oldest male pair was 75 weeks old. Our oldest female pair was 92 weeks old. And both of them were separated for lab reasons. It had nothing to do with their relationship. They weren't fighting anything like that. They had very positive relationships. Um, so we do get a significant number of actually very old rabbit pairs um, that are still a really successful stable pair. Okay, so the last question we're gonna answer is, what if I can't socially house my rabbit? So we all know that social housing is the best method to house a social species like rabbits, um, but what if we can't socially house them? So as we learned when discussing the regulations, there are justified situations to when you can't socially house. Um, and ALAC has come up with this really great graphic to show that even if we can't provide full-time social housing, we still need to look at the relative social experience of the animal to see how we can still meet its social needs. The easiest way that we found to do this is to drill holes in the dividers. Uh, so we drill five holes about the size of a quarter in the divider, and this provides protected access through the dividers. So this video is another really cute one of two adult males interacting through that divider with the holes. Um, this is especially important in the males because once they're separated, they're separated forever. So that male is going to be alone for the rest of his life. So by giving him these dividers with holes, you can still provide some sort of social experience for him, which is really important. Um, a study was actually done in 2010 to determine if the male rabbits actually preferred these social access dividers. So they had an opaque portion, so they didn't have to see their partner if they didn't want to, and they had a clear portion with a bunch of holes drilled into it, so they could have social contact if they wanted, but still in a protected way. So the cages were divided, um, and the rabbits were scored as either spending time in the social quarter when they chose to be by the clear divider with the holes, or when they were in separate cages, but spent time in the section adjacent to another rabbit in a separate cage. And the results found that the rabbits spent significantly more time in the social quarter of the cages with the perforated dividers. These rabbits also synced in their circadian rhythms and were more willing to approach unfamiliar staff due to the social buffering effect of having a quote unquote cage mate. Um, so it really provided a lot of value to these male rabbits. So another way to provide an alternative social experience is to provide part-time social housing. So this can be done by allowing rabbits to interact either in an open playpen or a divided playpen. Um, so this way they still get some exercise and interaction and playtime, but they're still divided so they can't get injured or anything like that. Um, so it's a way to really give them some sort of protected social contact. And since rabbits are often utilized in, an antibody, in antibody production studies, the question was posed as to whether antibody production would be affected by letting them um, have time in these um, play pens, either open or protected. Um, so an internal study done here at the University of Michigan found that the animals that were allowed to have open play times did not have an affected antibody production. So just to finish up here, uh, kind of have a quick programmatic thought. Um, this is an issue that has come up multiple times when we're dealing with rabbit social housing. It's the question of why do we tolerate minor wounding in other social species, but we're not willing to in rabbits. Um, oftentimes pigs and NHPs and mice will have small lesions associated with social housing, and institutions are willing to accept this as part of the pair housing process. However, when rabbits show related minor wounding, they're usually separated immediately. Um, so we just want to encourage everybody who's socially housing rabbits or thinking about socially housing rabbits to manage your expectations um, and really realize that social behavior may result in minor cosmetic defects, but the benefits of social housing greatly outweigh the negatives of isolation of a social species who puts a lot of value on social housing. Um, so I have selected references available here if you would like them. Um, and I have tons of people to thank, I won't go through everybody, but this is a huge, huge process. Um, as you can imagine, you need support from every single level, from you know 
the bottom to the top and everything in between. Um, and I am very grateful that we have a wonderful team here of all people from all different areas of our facility who have really put in a ton of time and effort and energy into making our program a success. And this, this is a huge undertaking and can absolutely not be done by one or two people. You need to have a solid team. Um, so I'm very grateful for all these people. So thank you very much for listening to this. My contact is here. I'm always willing to talk about rabbits. If you have any questions, please contact me. And does anybody have any questions today? Thank you so much, Sarah, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type that question into the box that appears on the screen and click that sun button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's take a look at our first incoming questions from our audience members. And thank you so much for your participation today. Our first question is, what advice would you give a facility trying to start up a rabbit social housing program? <clears throat> Great, thank you for that question. Um, so the advice that I would give a facility who wanted to start a rabbit social housing program, I think the most important advice is to do a lot of research. There's so much that goes into rabbit social housing, so much behavioral um, cues you need to understand. It's very similar to if you were to start a primate social housing program. You really are gonna wanna do your research to understand what behaviors you're looking for and what those behaviors are gonna indicate in terms of your pairing process. Um, I would also recommend making sure that you have buy-in from everybody before you start the process. Everybody who's involved really needs to be fully on board and committed to this process. If you have someone who's not fully committed, it can really um, make the process a lot more difficult. Um, so it's really important to from the husband or technician who's in the room every day, to the vet techs, to the vet staff, to the attending veterinarian, to the principal investigator and their lab staff, it's really crucial that everybody understands why you're doing this, why you wanna socially house these rabbits, and that they understand the benefits of social housing, the detriments of social isolation. Um, it's, it's just absolutely crucial that you have your whole team really bought into this process because it is such a team effort. You're gonna need that support from the whole team. Um, so those would be my biggest pieces of advice if you want to start a program. Thank you, Sarah. And what would you say, what are the resources that are available to help troubleshoot rabbit social housing programs? Yeah, um, so some of the resources are actually really new because this is such a, a new thing that we're all kind of trying to figure out together. Um, so one thing that I would recommend is we just wrote a paper for Jove on this exact process. Um, and it is in production and will be available as soon as the video is completed being edited. Um, it's really helpful because it goes through step by step each um, step of the pairing, each behavior you're looking for, what it indicates. Um, and then we also filmed a video tutorial to go along with it that shows you exactly what those behaviors look for, which is really crucial because before you've seen these rabbit interactions, you can't really understand what they look like until you see them um, because they look horrifying, honestly. They look terrible. They look like they're just killing each other. But then you separate them and check them and there's no lesions and they're completely fine. Um, they're very dramatic. Um, so it's really important for you to actually see this ahead of time so you know not to panic when you see it for the first time. Um, so I would definitely recommend checking out our Jove paper, um, which will be available soon. Also, our, I think it's really important to reach out to your colleagues. A lot of us are trying to figure this out as we go. Um, and there are some great online forums uh, like Larif and um, Comp Med are both really helpful to reach out to other people in the field who are trying to work through possibly some of the same issues that you are um, and might have some really good advice for you. Also, if you're interested in seeing the videos um, that I was not able to show you today, we did an, a ALAS webinar in 2016, um, and that is available online. So you can go watch that through the ALAS website as well. Um, and then lastly, um, kind of silly to plug myself, but 
uh, please contact me at any time. Rabbit Social Housing is my main research focus. Um, it is my main research interest. I've been doing this for uh, several years and I'm very interested and passionate and learning about it and I'm interested in all you know facets of it. So please feel free to contact me at any time with questions. I would love to help you troubleshoot your program um, in those, some of the ways that we've troubleshooted our own program. So yeah. And we have time for one more question from our audience members and I want to remind them that any questions not answered today will be answered via email. So our final question is, how do I convince others at my institution that social housing of rabbits is worth the risk? <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. That's another great question. Um, I think the best way to convince others that social housing rabbits is worth the risk is to really make them understand the benefits of social housing, um, as well as the detriments of social isolation. I think a lot of times we hear these horror stories about, you know, everyone's heard one horror story about I paired rabbits and they castrated each other, you know, some terrible, awful situation. Um, so we tend to think about that and think about how scary it is instead of really looking into how beneficial it is for our rabbits to be housed this way. Um, so I think it's really helpful to show people how much value the rabbits themselves put on social housing, how good it is for them, and also how detrimental it is when we singly house them just because we're scared that they might, you know, get in a little fight. Um, they're exhibiting serious signs of stress because of this um, single housing. Um, so I think it's really important to sh remind people of that as well. And especially to remind them that some of the physiological effects of this stress can have a really huge impact on their research outcomes. Um, so it's really just another layer of how valuable it is to socially house them. Um, and then since try and get the positive stories out too, I think that's really helpful since everyone has heard a negative story about social housing. Not as many people have heard positive stories of social housing. So if you have a good um, experience with it, tell people about it. Share with people what you've learned, what has worked for you. Um, that's really what we try and do is share what's worked and what hasn't worked for us. Um, and I will say we have been pairing rabbits, males and females, for at least four years now. And we average around a yearly census of about 400 or so rabbits a year. So we have a huge colony. Out of all of those that we've paired, we've only had two situations where we've had to euthanize a rabbit because of social housing issues. Um, and of course, you never, ever want to have that situation. You never want to have to euthanize an animal because of a social housing situation. However, um, when you weigh that against how many rabbits we've successfully paired and haven't had issues with, um, you can see that the percentage of um, bad situations are really minuscule compared to the amount of good situations. So I would just really try to remind everybody of that and let them know that the benefits genuinely do outweigh the risk. Sarah, I want to thank you again for your presentation today and for your important research. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through May of 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know that this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.